Today I want to talk to you about a three-step writing process. Now I know there are other people who will talk about uh, a five-step or a seven-step writing process. I find that to be far too much. I can remember three steps. So uh, I want to talk to you about the idea that good writers go through kind of three stages when they are um, when they are writing. So they go through a uh, pre-writing preparing stage even before they've written really a, a single thing um, then once they've got that ready they move into writing their draft when the first draft is complete they'll often leave it alone for say 24 hours and come back and then they look at that paper with an eye to polishing it and they look at two different things they look at the revising and the editing so there's three stages now Academic writing, and, and I really think that right now when you're in college, this is an opportunity to practice through academic writing. Uh, it's important because it gives you an opportunity to practice your communication skills and your professionalism. So uh, um, when you are able to write successfully, you and clear and communicate clearly, it uh, it it demonstrates a level of professionalism. And this is going to be important for any business reports that you do. When you have client interactions, it's important to communicate well. Uh, for example, for those of you that are in nursing or child and youth worker, you're going to have a lot of reports that you need to write uh, for office administration, for health. There may be business reports that you need to do. Um, electrical techniques, there might be a little bit less writing writing, uh, but you would be surprised how much writing goes on in the trades as well. And certainly communication with co-workers, communication with employers is something that happens often. Now, in academic writing uh, in particular, it also builds your credibility because in, in academic writing, we want you to support all of your positions with research. So that ability to support arguments with evidence and with citation is an important skill. And this gives you an opportunity to test that. It also is an opportunity to um, practice that formal tone, that appropriate business tone that avoids slang, swearing, casual language, jargon, all of those kinds of things. So I hope you look at your writing as assignments as an opportunity to try these things out in a safe environment. It really does turn into transferable skills that you're going to take on into your career. And it also is an opportunity to demonstrate demonstrate your academic integrity. When you give credit to the sources that you are using, uh, you are giving respect to other people and to their ideas, but also showing how that research enhances your arguments. Now, the pre-writing and planning stage really begins when you get your first assignment or, or whatever assignment you're working. When you get your first get your assignment, that might be a better way to say it. When you first get your assignment, it is important that you take a moment, read it over, and understand what you're being asked to do. OK, so take a look at the task. What do you need to do? Do you need to summarize? Do you need to analyze? Uh, do you need to compare and contrast? Uh, do you need to do a literature review? What is it that you're being asked to do? And identify all those key requirements. Uh, do you need to have any peer reviewed articles? What kind of research do you need to do? How long is the paper? What format does it need to be uh, in? When is the due date? And if you have any questions, Ask them as soon as possible. Um, I can honestly tell you as an instructor, it's a little bit depressing when students contact me like the day before an assignment is due and then ask questions. Um, it makes me much more happy when students are asking those questions early. So uh, if you do have questions, by all means, contact your instructors. The sooner you can understand your assignment, the better. 
once you've identified what it is that you need to do, this is a good time to kind of break down the task. Sometimes our writing's assignments seem like really big things that we have to do and can be overwhelming. I sometimes face that. It's like, I don't even know where to start. Um, but if you can start to break down that task into smaller pieces like understand your assignment, uh, create an outline, do your research, write your first draft. When you break it down into smaller tasks and smaller pieces, it can seem a little more manageable. I don't have to figure out how to do everything. I just need to figure out how to do this next piece. Okay. Uh, I do really encourage you to use, to use your assignment to create an outline, okay? And it can be as simple as I have an introduction, um, I have to identify a uh, an issue that's important in my field, I need to describe that issue and explain its significance. Those are some categories, some, uh, some um, sections of a paper that I can have. I can end up with a conclusion. That little bit of an outline, okay, helps you ensure that the information you are gathering to write your paper or assignment matches what the assignment is asking for. Amelia, I'm just going to turn your microphone off for a short time. I'm just getting a little bit of feedback from you and you're welcome to turn that back on if you have a question. Thanks. Now, after you have your outline, I always think it's wise to also take a look at your assignment and decide how much space you're going to allocate in your paper to each one of those sections. And I'm going to give you an example of why. Uh, so I have read a lot of really fabulous papers from students. And one of the things that happens is that students begin, start writing their introduction. And I've seen some really great introductions that are like a page and a half long of a five page paper. A page and a half introduction is too long for a five page paper. Often the introduction is only worth 10% and you've given more than 10% of your paper to that introduction. So what happens is that you run out of room later and you might have a section, let's say you're comparing contrasting and the contrasting part is worth 25 marks. Now you don't have enough room in your paper for that piece and you kind of lop off 25 marks right off the top from your assignment. So think about how much space you're going to need for each one of your sections. Now some things to think about when you are writing. Uh, academic writing does use that formal tone. So it's important that you use, it doesn't have to be what I call highfalutin language. It doesn't have to be like really scientific-y type language. It can be plain English, but it's going to have a neutral tone. OK, not too flowery, not too scientific. The best thing to do is to be clear and concise. So you want to express your ideas directly while avoiding unnecessary words or jargons. And you want to be objective. You want to focus on facts and evidence. And unless you're asked, you want to stay away from personal opinions. Now, there are times when you will have an assignment where your instructor will ask you you, give your opinion, give your thoughts, then of course you're going to do that. But for the most part, unless we're asked, we leave personal opinions and emotions out of it. And we always want to be evidence-based. We want to be supporting our arguments with credible sources and proper citations. When we're formatting our papers, please ensure that you have double spacing. This makes your paper easy to read. I always think about, imagine that you're in a class of 60 students and you, it's like 1130 on Saturday night while your instructor is trying to mark all of these papers and your paper number 59 at 1130, the second last one, um, and your instructor is tired, believe me, it happens. You want your paper to be formatted properly with double space, easy to read, okay? So that you don't make it harder on your instructor. That's the way I think about it. 
Now you do want to indent your paragraphs. You want to have use a standard font like fonts uh, Times New Roman 12 point. Have one inch margins all the way around and do ensure that you have a title page and you use headings in your paper to organize the sections. This is especially true if your instructor has given you <coughs> either a rubric or a uh, um, an assignment that says for this section of the paper, this is worth so many marks. So for let's, let's say you have to compare and contrast. So first you have to introduce your paper, then you have to introduce your topic, your two topics and explain them. And then you have to compare these two things and then you contrast these two things. Maybe you have to pick one, okay? Make it easy to mark, all right? Uh, so have in there. Um, comparing this thing and this thing, contrasting this thing and this thing, um, my opinion or, um, you know, um, you choose one of them and say, I prefer this one. Those headings help me as your instructor know this is where I'm to look for the ideas and the information uh, that fit into this section of, of your assignment that I'm marking. And if I'm looking for 20 marks, this is the section of the paper that I'm going to find those 20 marks. Uh, so headings, important to use. Now, just remember when you're doing your paragraphs, and paragraphs are very important, I'm seeing lately um, like paragraphs that are a page and a half, two pages long. That's far too big, okay? Shorter paragraphs are better. Uh, the, the things I want you to remember is that every paragraph is about one major idea, okay? And it's going to start with a topic sentence that introduces what that major idea is. After that, you're going to have a few supporting details, and then you're going to end up with a transition sentence, something that takes me from this idea into the next idea that your next paragraph is going to be about. So you can see if you've got a couple, two, three supporting details with a topic sentence and a transition sentence paragraphs are at least three sentences long usually four or five but when they start being like a page a page and a half that's too many and then you need to go back and try to look at what are the ideas in this larger paragraph where can I break it up now I also recommend that you do your research before you begin writing I do this myself. Sometimes I have an idea. I get asked to write a lot of reports for my boss and he'll say, Irene, well, what do you think about this idea? And, you know, go do some research about it and I'll go do some. I have some ideas, but I don't want to say anything or I don't want to write anything until I actually do the research because I could be wrong. I could end up changing my ideas based on the research. And actually, when that happens, that's the best research ever. All right. Because most of our assignments that we give you, um, we're using these as learning activities. We can't cover everything you need to learn in class. So these assignments are a chance to help show you how you can teach yourself, how you can learn independently, because you're going to need to do that in the future in your careers. Right. So we want you to do research and learn more beyond what we have told you in the classroom. So we want you to do your research. And I encourage you to look at more sources of information than you actually need. Uh, so, for example, if you're looking for, say, three peer reviewed articles, I want you to look at nine and pick the best three, the three that are going to help you give you evidence to help you write your paper now. Excuse me, I'm not suggesting that you read from start to finish nine articles, okay? I'm suggesting you look at them, maybe that you look at the description, the abstract, you look at the introduction, the findings, if it's a research article. And then from that information, decide which are the best three. Okay. Now, once you've decided which three you're going to do, and I like to... Re to um, print my articles out okay uh, when I print them out that gives me a chance as I'm reading them I'm highlight stuff I make notes in the margin and I try to write down some key points 
um, some phrases, some key words. Um, I don't write full sentences, but I try to, on the front of the article or on a cover sheet to the article, I try to write down the important ideas that I'm getting from this reading. OK, and sometimes I just name them Article one, Article two, Article three, and then I get my outline out. All right. And I look at the different sections of my outline that I know I have to write about and I make notes based on what I've read from these articles. I say, OK, Article one has these good points that will go in this section and Article two has these good points that will go in the contrast section. And if I do that, ahead of time, I can look at my outline and see, do I have good information in all the different areas I have to write about? If I don't, I might need to go out and get another article and add a fourth article so that I have good evidence for every part of my paper. Now, once I've decided that I'm actually going to use something in my paper, that's when I create my reference and my citation. Now, your reference is what goes, has all the information about your source that goes at the end of your paper. And your citation, if you're using APA, it's simply in brackets, the author's name, comma, the year, in brackets at the end of a sentence. That's all you need for the in-text citation. So for every sentence where you mention some an idea you got from your research, you're going to put that citation in, and the simplest way to do that is at the end of the sentence. So I just want to mention the idea, if you are getting information from websites, be a little bit cautious because there is a lot of garbage on the internet. So you want to ensure that you are considering the timeliness, when, how recent is this information, the relevance, is it going to help me write my paper, the, the authority, is the author credible? And the purpose, what was the purpose for why this article was written or this information was is put on the website? Is it to inform? Is it to persuade? Is it trying to sell you something? Okay, you need to be a little bit cautious. Another way to look at it is this. Consider in terms of timeliness, when was it published? Has it ever been updated? If it's 10, 15 years ago, that's probably information that's too old. Um, Got to make sure that it has information that is going to cover at least part of your topic that's going to fit somewhere in your outline. You can find some really great information out there, but it's unnecessary. And remember, we're trying to be concise. You need to know who the author, the owner of the website, the agency is. Can you trust them as a reliable source? You need to be cautious there. And you need to think about why it was written. If there's a bias behind it, what is the purpose of the article or website? You want to get information rather than an, uh, get information from a website that is trying to sell you something, health information, for example. Instead of getting an informa uh, information from a website that's trying to sell you a exercise program or a drug, maybe instead go to a government government agency like Health Canada for your health information, or if you're looking for, <coughs> excuse me, um, ideas on, on um, diabetes, for example, go to the Canadian Diabetes Association, all right, who's going to have credible information rather than a website that's trying to sell you equipment or something like that. So be cautious. Now, I do highly recommend that you research starting with the library, and I'm hoping we'll have a few minutes at the end that I can demonstrate how to do that. Um, when you are looking for peer-reviewed articles in particular, you're going to want to start with the library rather than Google because you're going to find information that your professors are going to love. Not only that, Journal entries can be kind of tricky when you're trying to develop the reference that you put at the end of your paper. If you get an article from our library website, there's a button there that's going to give you the citation that you can copy and paste from the library website into your reference and it's going to be perfect. That is a big time saver for me. 
Now, when you begin drafting, writing your first draft, the main idea, uh, the, the main thing is to try to get your ideas down on paper, okay? And um, I encourage you to look at paraphrasing or summarizing rather than just doing word for word direct quotes. When you do a quote, all that really tells me is that you can recognize somebody else's good idea, all right? It doesn't tell me that you understood that idea or that you were able to incorporate it with information that you are learning in your classes. When you paraphrase and summarize, when you put ideas into your own words, that's when you tell me that you can, that you've understood it and you're incorporating it. So with paraphrasing, summarizing, you're keeping the original meaning of the, the idea, but you're changing both the words and the sentence structure so it matches your purpose and your interpretation of that information. So paraphrasing, uh, we call paraphrasing this when we take one idea from a paper and we turn that into our own words. <clears throat> Sometimes students will try to just change a couple of words and they'll keep the sentence exactly the same. We call that cosmetic paraphrasing uh, and cosmetic plagiarism. And you don't want to do that. You want to change both the sentence structure and most or some of the words. There's some words you are not going to change. OK, uh, for example, if you're writing a, a definition of diabetes, you have to use the word diabetes. You can't call it something else. So you don't necessarily have to change all the words, but you definitely need to put it into your the idea into your own words. So it fits what you're writing and in a sentence structure that fits in your paragraph. When you summarize, you're taking information from an entire source an article, a website, a book, and you're just condensing it down to the main ideas. <clears throat> if you do use a quote, and you're welcome to, um, you have to take those, uh, that, that kind of quote, the word for word uh, copy and paste from someone else's work. And you have to put that in quotation marks. You have to quote, have quotation marks at the beginning and at the end of the list of words that you've taken from someone else's source. You do have to put in brackets the author of that information and the year but you have to add a third piece of information that we don't need if you're doing a paraphrase or summarize. Uh, what you have to add is either a paragraph number if it's like a website, okay? And you start at the beginning and just count the number of paragraphs until you reach the paragraph that has the words that you copied and pasted. Uh, and you add that para, P-A-R-A period three, or if it's a book, or a journal article, you're going to give the page number, which is simply P period, and then whatever the page number is. So it's a little bit different when you're citing that. You need to give a little bit more information and don't forget those quotation marks. I like to use the ICE method when I'm incorporating, incorporating an idea from someone else's uh, uh, writing uh, or thoughts into my paper. And I do that using the ICE method where I introduce the information first, then I give it with a citation, and then I explain it. And it's important to do that. When you introduce it, you got to give a little bit of a context. You might introduce the author or the idea to give the reader some background information. Then you add the specific information, that's the C part, the cite, the quote, the paraphrase, or the summarize, along with the citation. And then, to me, this is the most important thing, you explain why you include Included that information. How does it fit into your paper? And it makes a nice little sandwich of uh, your words, someone else's ideas, followed by your words. Really great way to add someone else's ideas, evidence into your paper and still keeping it yours. Now, we've been talking a little bit about re referencing and citation, and some people think it's really tough, and it doesn't have to be. Uh, when you break it down to its very simplest, there's only four pieces of, uh, pieces of information that you're looking for. The who, the when, the what, and the where. You need to know who is the author, 
When was it published? What is the title of the article, the title of the book, uh, the title of the web page, and where was it published? For a web page, that's going to be the URL. It's as simple as that. Okay, so those are those four pieces of information. So as I said, the basic information for a website, the author, the year, the title of the web page, and the URL. Those four pieces of information go into your reference and in brackets, the author and the year go into the body, into the, into the sentences at the end of the sentence. And with those two pieces of information, author and year, I can go, your reader, I can go to the references and find all the other information if I want to look at the same source that you looked at. So let's take a look at that for a moment. I might have mentioned before, if you've if you've had a, a a workshop with me before, I have a 98 year old mother, and she's a pistol. Let me tell you, she keeps me on my toes. And her goal at 98 is to continue to live in her own apartment. And I'm like, you go, mom. If I can keep you there, that's what we're going to do. So I recently did some research to find out, are there some devices I can use to help her stay in her home? And I found this article from Wirecutter. And so if you look at this article, you can see the New York Times wire cutter that's at the top. That's the online magazine that I found the article. The article title is the best smart home devices to help aging in place. And I see that Rachel and I'm not going to say her name right. Sisicola. Not sure how to pronounce her name. And I can see the date there that this was published on. And in the top left hand corner, I have the url so here's the information there's my four pillars the who the what the who the when the what and the where and that's the information i need both for my reference and for my citation now sometimes <clears throat> we don't have a person as an author that sometimes uh, um, confuses students okay sometimes it's not a person sometimes it's a government a agency and not for profit. Sometimes it's a business that is considered the author of this information. And that was the case for a uh, guide I found, excuse me, I'm going to cough. <coughs> a guide I found from the government of Ontario and the guide is a guide to programs and services for seniors. Looking for, are there some programs that I might be able to sign my mom up for? And on that web page, I was able to find the author, Government of Canada. The year was 2023. The title was A Guide to Programs and Services for Seniors. And there's my URL. Those are the four pieces of information that I need. Simple as that. Now, references are things that go into the last page of your paper on a reference sheet. So here's an example of that information we got from the very first article that I showed you formatted for references. So you can see I have the author's last name, comma, followed by their first initial with a period. In brackets, I have the year 2023 followed by the period. I have the title of the web page, and you notice the title of the web page, only the first letter of that title is in capitals. We use what's called sentence case for the title of the web page. Now, the name of the website that I got that from, it's from an online magazine, New York Times, wire cutter, we put that into italics, followed by here's the URL, as simple as that. That's all I need for my reference. My citation is going to be just the last name and the year. So Siri Cola, comma, 2023 in brackets. And I'm going to tuck that at the end of a sentence that I have in my paper to show that I got ideas from Siri Cola and uh, what they wrote in their article and for that sentence. Now, the the goal is to have the author's last name in the year in the sentence. I find the easiest way is to put it in brackets and tuck it at the end of the sentence, like you see in the first example there. Uh, 
bracket Smith comma 2020 bracket in the period from the sentence, but you don't have to. You can add the last name as part of the sentence as the second example shows according to Smith and then just put 2020 in brackets or you can talk about the year and the author as part of the sentence and not have to have any brackets. It's all good it, as long as you have those two pieces of information as part of your sentence it's considered your citation. So you have some options. If you have a corporate author, then that corporation becomes in the author space. So this is an example for Microsoft. Microsoft in Education was the article I read. It was from 2022. My citation for that article is going to be bracket Microsoft comma 2022. So instead of the last name of a person, I just have the name of the corporate author. The same holds true for government author. I can have government of Ontario in the place of the author and use government of Ontario comma 2022 in brackets at the end of my sentence for the citation. Now, there are some other sources. I have an example here. If it's a book, um, in the, uh, the difference really is that for the publisher, for the where, I have the name of the publisher. And that's actually pretty easy to find in the front of the book. Often, uh, where you in the first couple of pages, you'll see the title of the book. That's where you can find the author and the publisher. And the... Um, the year that it's published is sometimes tucked away on a second page under its copyright <coughs> section. Excuse me. <coughs> now, the next one I'm going to show you is a journal. You can say now it's getting a little confusing. We need to have a volume number and an issue number and the title of the journal. Um, and that's why I suggest for articles, use the library and get your information there. Uh, and if you don't, that's okay. Those pieces of information are still pretty easy to find. And I've got a couple of examples of, uh, this is from a database page from the library. You can find all the information that you need. And here's an example from an online article that is in an online journal. All the information is generally at the top of your article. You can also use YouTube, for example. It's kind of fun because then you get to use the weird YouTube username. Whoever posted it, that's your, your creator or your author. Uh, you have the name of the video, whatever the name happens to be. Just make sure that in square brackets, you add the word video so that we know that that's a video file and not a, um, a written work. The name of the website is YouTube, and then you tuck in the URL. Uh, here is an example of where I found those pieces of information from a video that I created for Thrives. So that takes us through the drafting stage. We're in the home stretch now. Now we're into revising and editing. And I do think of them as two different things. When you first come back to look at your um, article or your paper or your assignment, uh, don't worry about grammar and spelling yet. Leave that alone for a minute. Take a look at your content. And in fact, what I suggest you do is that you take your article, or no, I'm sorry, you take your assignment back out again and you put it beside what you have written and you compare them. You double check that you have fulfilled all of the things in the article in the assignment that you were asked to do. OK, if you didn't, then you may need to add some information. All right. If your paper's too long, you might have to remove some of that. Take a look. If your introduction's too long, shorten that up and take some of that out. OK. Sometimes you have to replace information. And I think one key area is if you're doing research and you've got a lot of American content or content from other countries and you don't have any Canadian content, I'm going to recommend that you replace some of that information with uh, Canadian content. <clears throat> if you don't mind, and I use the example of an of a article or a paper on diabetes, if you have in there that 22% of Americans over 30 35 have diabetes that's great that's nice information but we live in Canada I want to know how many people over 35 have diabetes in Canada that's more important to me so replace that uh, 
The other thing you want to look at is the organization of your paper. Do you have your ideas in a logical order? Have you introduced an idea or a topic or a term before you start explaining it or talking about it? Sometimes just moving some information around a little bit makes your paper much clearer. I would say of all the things that students do, um, that where if you spent a little bit more time, you could really improve your writing, it would be this part. If you would take a double check what you've written against your assignment and take a look at your content and think about, is there something I need to add, remove, replace, or rearrange? It's time well spent. The last part, is then looking for grammar, spelling, punctuation, looking at the clarity and conciseness where you're cutting out any unnecessary words, where you're using an active voice, avoiding uh, repetition, simplifying the sentence structure, all of those kinds of things can really help. When you are checking your grammar, spelling, and punctuation, I'm gonna warn you, it can be hard to find your own mistakes. I have trouble finding my own mistakes. Uh, so you can read it out loud, read it up from the bottom so you're focused on one sentence at a time, ask a friend to help you, but there's also some proofreading tools that you can use.